Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Thank you for tuning in to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm your host, Joel Berg, and thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Be sure to visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. Our guest today is Dr. Clarice Law. She is a clinical professor in the sections of pediatric dentistry and orthodontics in the Division of Associated Clinical Specialties at the UCLA School of Dentistry. She's received her dental degree from Harvard School of Dental Medicine. She completed specialty training both in pediatric dentistry and orthodontics, also at UCLA. Dr. Law is teaching pediatric dentistry and orthodontics to dental students and residents, has done many things in academics, in organized dentistry with the APD. She's done an incredible amount, and she has developed a special expertise in biophysico-social, and I'll have her talk about that, changes in individuals throughout the stages of life. And she's, she's an active teacher. She's an expert on behavior guidance. So our topic today with Dr. Law and, and Clarice, I'm really thrilled that you've decided to talk to us about this today because this is probably one of the uh, most important topics to a pediatric dentist is non-pharmacological behavior guidance. So with that long intro, I wanted to say thank <laughs> you very much for being here, and I really appreciate it. We're going to have an interesting talk today. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I'm I'm also really excited to talk about this because it's it's something that I think is also very, very important. Yeah, and I'm sure as a, and I'm going to focus on the pediatric dentist part of you today, uh, although this is obviously important to orthodontics too, although there you're seeing mainly older children. So mm -hmm. it's probably, so we're going to focus on the half of you, or I'm going to say 80% <laughs> of you that's a pediatric dentist and, and talk about that because I think like me and like all pediatric dentists, uh, general dentists often come up to us and say, I'm so glad you're there. Boy, I could never do what you do. And what they're talking about is is this, is this topic, is behavior guidance. They just don't want to deal with it. So, mm -hmm. you know, what got you interested in this? I mean, you, you're an expert and you have a particular interest. What did you, how did you get interested in, in this behavior guidance subject? Oh, well, that's kind of a funny story. Uh, basically, I kind of painted myself in a corner. When I first graduated with training in both disciplines, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to practice both disciplines to the absolute best of, of my abilities or somebody who was uh, solo trained. And so I decided to, to cut a little bit on the, on the corners in terms of what types of things I would be involved in. So in ortho, I decided no adult ortho. I'm just going to focus on kids. And then on the pediatric dentistry side, I decided, okay, then uh, no nothing above nitrous oxide, no moderate sedation, no GA. And so that's where I ended up painting myself in a corner. I ended up having to limit myself uh, solely to non-pharmacological behavior guidance techniques. Wow, that's interesting. And so do you feel that this has changed a lot since you started practicing? I mean, I, I think that's a rhetorical question because the rest of this <laughs> conversation today is going to talk specifically about how it's changed. But so maybe you could just kind of at a high level how has non-pharmacological behavior guidance technique, how have they changed and what, what information is there around that? Mm, yeah. So I uh, finished my training in 1998 and uh, came out learning voice control. I actually learned hand over mouth uh, and that was reserved me for too, very... Me too, me yeah. too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was reserved for really special circumstances. But within a few years, I noticed a lot of changes. I, I noticed parents getting upset when I was using voice control. I noticed that parents wanted to be in the room more frequently or actually expected to be in the in the treatment area more frequently. And then, of course, uh, passive restraint. Those were all things that I, I felt like parents were less accepting of and I was using less frequently. I see. I, I know that the APD had a pretty significant symposium back in 2003 related to behavior management. Was that a pivotal time? And did things did that, would you say that kind of reflected the changes that were already going on or did it lead the changes that were to occur after that? Oh, that's an interesting question. I didn't attend that particular meeting, but when I was feeling all of these changes um, in my own practice, uh, I was trying to figure out, well, what's going on? And so I, I went to the literature and I started reading some of the uh, some of the articles that came out of that symposium, and I felt like it really resonated with what I was was experiencing. And so 
my guess is that uh, other providers that were a part of that particular symposium or nationwide even uh, were feeling the same thing that I was feeling in order for it to be reported at the at the symposium. I see. So what, what was that you were feeling when you say what you were feeling, what you were seeing? What, what, how would you describe that? Well, I guess it started with a sense that parents had different expectations. And then I was trying to figure out, well, why is it that parents have different expectations? And so what I was started thinking is, well, society seems to be changing. And I think that that's what I saw coming out of the those early symposia reports were different societal influences. So maybe changes in the nature of our relationships with parents no longer being like the, the expert who dictates treatment and moving to more of a, a partner in care. But also, I think different different things going on in terms of like family dynamics changing with the role of the parent changing and well, also in cha- changes in family structure as well with the increase in divorce at the time. Mm-hmm. And I th- so you brought up probably the most important part of our conversation today, and that's parenting. And I think we could we could probably look at the name of our specialty, pediatric dentistry, and perhaps consider calling it parent dentistry, <laughs> <laughs> because really uh, what reflects the issues we deal with, both with behavior guidance and you know, informed consent and everything, really involves the parents as much, if not more, than the child. I mean, I think you yeah. would agree. Mm-hmm. And so you're talking about, so speaking of parents, I'm going to ask you a whole lot about about this because you know there, there's so much we could discuss, uh, including, I want to reflect later on, you know, parents in the operatory. I mean, when I trained, uh, it was a while ago, parents didn't come to the operatory. It was rare. Mm-hmm. Now it's rare right. that they don't. It's very rare. Complete mm-hmm. switch. And that's, you know, I don't, again, I don't know if that's the chicken or the egg. Is it because of the parenting styles or the other way around? So so what is different? I mean, there's so much you could say, but what, what is different about parenting today? You talked a little bit about that, but maybe a little bit more you could tell us about that. Well, that's really complicated. I've been I've been trying to figure that out and uh, going to the literature to try to figure it out. And the complicated thing there is that if you look at like psychology studies, they tend to focus more on um, pathologic or aberrant family dynamics and not necessarily uh, what's happening within normal limits. So that's what, what makes it a little bit tough to try to figure out what's going on. And so since I wasn't finding good, clear answers there, I started looking at uh, – blogs, actually, to get an idea, at least, I guess it's kind of a crowdsourced or a, a, a group consensus idea on what's changing. And so, like, the websites for educators and parents are uh, starting to talk about different sort of trends that we see happening in, in, in parenting. I see. And what about outside? I mean, we're talking about parenting. Obviously, the impact of these changes in parenting styles is not only in our specialty, it's not only in dentistry, but what about the non non pediatric dentistry, non dentistry literature? What kind of things are you seeing there that support some of the changes that we're seeing? Mm. So these uh, these uh, parenting websites or educator websites, um, I've seen changes in terms of the labels of parenting types as opposed to what what you might see in the psychology literature. Like psychology literature, we would have uh, Diana Baumrin's typology of authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, indulgent or neglectful or, and uninvolved. But I've seen different labels come up in the websites, the educator and parent websites uh, that would suggest labels like the helicopter parent, the stealth fighter parent, <laughs> the lawnmower parent, mm-hmm. and uh, different things like that. Free ranging, I think you talked to me about that. So what, what, is, what, what, is a, what is a free range parent, by the way? Oh, free range parent. I was is looking that a at California this. thing or is that a, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> You know what? It might, it might actually be a California thing. <laughs> yeah. So what is that exactly? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, this is a movement that seemed to emerge somewhere in the late 2000s, 2009. And uh, I think the free range parent movement, from what I've been reading, seems to be as a, a, a response to the helicopter stealth fighter lawnmower more parent. And so... In this style, they're trying to take a little bit more of a observer role as a parent, um, basically encouraging children to function independently and with uh, without too much parental su- supervision. And so, just so, briefly, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Oh, I was just going to say, so the free range parents are trying to consider the the child's stage of development and what would be appropriate in terms of uh, increasing level of responsibility to give their kids. I see. So I think we know what you talked about helicopter. We know what that is. So just mm-hmm. so we all know. 
Stealth fighter parent, briefly, what is that? Uh, so stealth fighter parent, that's something that I saw come up in the uh, educator websites. And uh, this phrase was, it's credited to Neil Howe, and it emerged around 2007 or so. And the difference between the helicopter parent, the helicopter parent is always hovering around nearby, trying to be helpful, essentially. Uh, the stealth fighter parent observes from a little bit further out. So further out, and then basically is more almost defensive is the way that Neil Howe described it, is if they see any threat to their kids, they can basically surgically excise the issue and attack the issue. And ah, so it sounds like a rather, yeah, it is a, a, a sounds rather... Sounds pretty a, harsh. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Heat-seeking missiles and things like that, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and lawnmower parent, briefly, what is that? Ah, so the lawnmower parent, I saw that come up in the parent blogs and the educator blogs somewhere around 2013, 14. And the difference between the lawnmower parent basically is the lawnmower parent is going right in front of the child, trying to clear the path, smooth over any rough patches before their wow. children even even encounter them. So the parent who says, everything okay, Johnny? Is everything okay for you right now? That one? Mm-hmm. Would that be a, okay? I've never seen one. I've never seen one of those parents before. All my parents are great. Um, <laughs> but, and, um, okay. So what do, you, what do people think is behind these uh, trends in parenting societally? And you've kind of alluded to this, but, and I guess I also want to ask you, do you, do you see any changing in that? I don't think it's going to regress to the way it was. It's probably going to get you could say worse or more advanced in the current form, or what is your thinking on all that? Mm. Well, a number of people, including uh, Neil Howe, who coined the stealth fighter parent, uh, a number of people think that it's actually related to to generational differences. And um, there's a the really interesting theory. It's the Strauss and Howe generational diagonal um, that's been quoted from the Pew Research Center and a number of different sources. But basically. They were looking at the different generations and suggesting that there are trends among the changes in the generations. For example, what are some of those generational trends? Ah, so then, general. Well, I first I would start by defining the different generations, which I think most people are familiar with. But we have our baby boomers who are between the ages of about fifty four seventy two. We have our Gen Xers who are about thirty eight to fifty three. And then we have our millennials who are uh, the newer parents, but they're between 21 and, and 37 years of age. But okay. what's, what Strauss and Howe were proposing is that uh, there are actually cycles that occur in generations. And uh, there are 80 to 100 year cycles with four different archetypes is what they see. And what they basically think is these archetypes, they, they have some basic attitudes that they share towards family, towards risk, culture, and different things like that. And they actually see parenting driving these shifts in the generations. So they think that global events will shape the experience of an individual when they're a child, which then changes the perspective of their particular parents. So the example that they give is the the baby boomers who were born after the war. They had a nice, peaceful time. And so they were raised in a very relaxing environment. And then what Strauss and Howe suggest is that this generation then essentially reacts to that and goes almost to the opposite direction. And so what they suggest is the the baby boomers who are raised in a a relaxed environment, they actually uh, have raised their children in a more tightened environment. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. It's uh, it's there's, there there is some historical and uh, descriptive information that talks about why we have gotten to where we are. Very interesting. We're going to pause now for a word from our sponsor. Hugh Freedy is the global leader in dental instrument manufacturing and infection prevention solutions that keep you performing at your best. For more information on Hugh Freedy products, visit HughFreedy.com slash AAPD crowns. That's Hugh Freedy.com slash AAPD crowns. And enter the promo code 2682 if placing an order for pedo crowns. We are back talking to Dr. Clarice Law from the UCLA School of Dentistry. Hello again. Dr. L- Hi, Clarice. And we're, <laughs> we're talking about behavior guidance, and we were discussing the way history has changed things for us and about some of the reasons behind the generational differences. And I want to now turn to how this has affected the children. So, you know, I said maybe we should call it parent dentistry, but it is pediatric dentistry <laughs> that we're involved in. And how has this affected the children, uh, given all the things that we've talked about? 
Well, uh, from the lay perspective, again, the, the blog perspective, the educators and the parenting bloggers seem to think that children don't necessarily have to solve their problems because they've got a stealth fighter parent or a helicopter parent solving their, solving their problems. That's the thought process behind that. And then I saw in the handbook that, that it was summarized that a higher number of kids uh, lack the coping skills that we used to expect of children from, from previous generations. But then if wow. you look into the, yeah, but then if you look into the uh, psychology literature, um, what you'll see is there's increase in the diagnosis of, di- of disruptive behavior disorders, there increase in anxiety disorders. So it's, it's not just from the blog, the lay perspective, it's also coming from uh, an evidence-based perspective that kids are responding to stresses in a different way than they used to. I see. So what, what has been the response to all these changes? Maybe first talking about from education, maybe education globally, and maybe if you want to talk about dental education. Mm. So I, again, I was looking at what uh, teachers were writing about, and uh, a number of teachers have referenced a couple of textbooks, or not textbooks, actually, they're mass market books. So Carol Dweck's The Growth, Mi- Growth Mindset, which was published in 2007, um, Angela Duckworth in her book on grit, um, it seems to me that a lot of the educators are responding by trying to push the children to have kind of a, well, I guess it would be a growth mindset to to challenges, is to view challenges as an opportunity to grow as opposed to an obstacle that's that's going to, you know, defeat them. And that's basically the idea behind grit as well, is that perseverance, passion, moving forward, those are the things that can help a person overcome challenges and succeed into the future. So how does that kind of influence choice and, you know, affect our choice in non-pharmacological behavior guidance techniques? And talking about the techniques that we can do today, you mentioned hand over mouth is gone. I remember that conference mm-hmm. when we talked about it and there was some emotional, there were emotional pleas to keep it. It was an effective technique, but it was gone. It's gone. Mm-hmm. And so how does all this stuff affect our choice in the non-pharmacological behavior guidance techniques? Uh, that's complicated also. And- yes. For for me, I I really want to practice uh, evidence based uh, clinical practice, and so I've been you know trying to figure out okay what are the new evidence based practices, and I don't know that we've responded uh, quickly enough as a community, a pediatric dentistry community, to the need to develop new new techniques, and so I, I yeah I was recently looking at. Uh, the handbook on pediatric dentistry, and I got I got to give a hat tip to Martha Wells and Janice Townsend. They did a what I think is a terrific summary um, of the behavior guidance techniques in the handbook. Um, basically, they they summarize the different techniques that are listed, um, some of the indications, contraindications, and then they talked about the level of evidence. And what I saw was that most of the behavior guidance techniques have really fair to weak level of evidence and support. And so what's complicated is we don't have a very strong evidence behind behavior guidance techniques. So that's what I I think is difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, I heard that a long decades ago, you know, we heard that there there were a lot of studies related to pharmacological technique, pharmacologic techniques, but not as much with the non-pharmacologic techniques. Yes. You're saying that's still the case today and perhaps we need some more. And I, I guess, what would you focus on? What would be some of the areas? This is a good message for some of our residents uh, who have to study something. It's a message for faculty uh, Mm -hmm. who are looking for a career in research. Um, What what would be some of the areas you'd recommend that we look at specifically? Well, I did notice that uh, in the guidelines, there were a number of uh, techniques like motivational interviewing, ask, tell, ask, um, that were pulled straight from the pediatrics literature and then put into our guidelines. But I I don't know if they've been uh, tested in the pediatric dentistry setting but I don't, I'm not 100% sure of where we would look then for techniques. So for me, as, as I've been trying to figure out how to respond to this different type of parent, or what I feel is a different type of parent, I actually started going to look at parenting books and find out what psychologists uh, and educators are recommending in terms of communicating with kids in a different way. And what did you find there? Oh, well, I've I've started to to uh, pull a, pull from a couple of resources that I'll recommend because I've really enjoyed reading them. Um, one is the Parenting with Love and Logic uh, system by Foster Klein and Jim Fay, which was published in the early 90s. And then another 
what I think is an amazing series of books. It comes from Daniel Siegel, who's a psychiatrist here at, at UCLA. Um, and so he's got a, a really interesting series of books as well. Wow. So are those books going to help us more, seems like, with the understanding of where the parent's head is at? Or is it is it going to help us actually with choosing what techniques to deploy in our practice? Mm. Well, Dan Siegel, in uh, my favorite book that he published is called The Whole Brain Child, which was pr- published in 2011. He actually comes from the perspective that when a child's misbehaving, there's something going on in their in their brains, essentially. And he suggests that brain development, uh, it takes time for the brain to develop. And sometimes the issue with kids is they just haven't learned how to integrate what's going on in their brain. So he talks well, a goes, lot about... That goes back to parenting, though, doesn't it? I mean, it goes back to the what, how the parents, what the parents' role is to teaching them to be um, effective in different situations, circumstances, rather than I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prevent you from having to deal with that circumstance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that plays a really, really important role. I've been using it to try to help me figure out, well, okay, if, if, a, mis- if a child's misbehaving, what's, what's really going on? And so he talks in this particular book about uh, left brain versus right brain, this whole idea of left brain being a little bit more logical. But in a kid, if a kid's going to respond with their left brain, they'll end up being more, becoming more rigid. And so then, this, is right, the, but this is just for our listeners, this book is referring to as The Whole Brain Child, right? Correct, correct. That's the title. Okay, thank mm-hmm. you. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. And then it, contrasting left brain to right brain, right brain is the more emotional, big picture side, according to neurophysiology writings, but, or I'm sorry, neuropsychology. Um, so the right brain is a little bit more m- emotional, big picture. But if a child's like, if a child's uh, operating strictly in the right brain, then they tend to be more chaotic. And I so see. Siegel suggests that kids basically they don't integrate well between their left and right brain and they're bouncing back and forth between being rigid or chaos. And so for me it's if a kid's misbehaving I'm trying to figure out okay are they going left brain or are they going right brain and trying to figure out how to address them where they are. Right. And I think that you know one of the challenges we face as a pediatric dental practitioner is you know, there are also issues and constraints and regulatory things related to sedation and general anesthesia Mm -hmm. we hear about, and that's not our topic today. But of course, that pushes us to question, maybe we should attempt to revert back to our ways from the past, which is more non-pharmacologic techniques. But when you consider the changes in parental acceptance, Mm -hmm. some of the basic, even some of the basic techniques with voice and tell, show, do perhaps, What's the role of non-pharmacological behavior guidance if we have pharmacological options? Ah, uh, yes. And that's something that I've been uh, thinking about a lot. Uh, I think also in the wake, because I work with residents, and they do have, there are training expectations, sorry, training expectations, uh, competency expectations for them to gain experience in the pharmacologic techniques. And so I do feel that some of our younger providers or our residents, they tend to move back toward the pharmacologic options. And it makes me sad because I feel like our uh, gift in pediatric dentistry is to learn how to work with the kids from a non-pharmacologic perspective. So one of the things I do think about is, you know, I'm a big fan of your continuum of caries management uh, approach. And I'm a big fan of the way that we're thinking about medical management of caries as opposed to, you know, treatment, 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 restore, restore, sorry, it should be restore, restore, restore. And so I I do believe that if we're going to move towards the medical model management of caries, we are going to have to learn non-pharmacological techniques and to really address those techniques because sometimes those appointments can be hard appointments. Yeah, they can. I think, I think uh, you've enlightened us today. There's a lot of stuff for us to learn and there, there, I mean, there's there, one of the reasons we all chose this specialty and we love it is because we feel like we have something to offer in that regard. Mm-hmm. That we can provide a good experience to children because we're experienced in providing this non pharmacologic management as well. We have to be able to do it all. And that, that was really interesting. So, I, I think in closing, could I say, or could you say to us, Dr. <laughs> Law, that, uh, that there is a future in maybe some growth opportunities in non pharmacological behavior managed, behavior guidance Absolutely. techniques? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And I think there's what I heard today is there's some room for research, 
There's some room to rethink how we do things and case selection, and maybe we can do both well. We can be good at both sedation and, and anesthesia, of course, and also with reverting back to our what made us want to do this in the first place, to be really mm-hmm. good at all levels in dealing with children. Mm-hmm. Wow, that was fantastic. So I, I thank you so much for, for uh, being with us today. That was enlightening, and I'm going to rethink what I do because of it. And I thank our audience for coming in today and listening with Dr. Clarice Law from UCLA. And this is Pedo Teeth Talk. We bring you the contemporary issues important to you in your practice. And we are here because of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm your host, Joel Berg, and thank you very much for tuning in today. Thank you. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.